in that context, then I'm really quite happy to have Dr. Harold put off with us tonight. Al is an old friend that we've spent far too many times sitting in board meetings for forever and ever in Las Vegas and other places on, on boards that we sat on. But I've come to appreciate him particularly because he's a world-class physicist. I mean, he's built an extraordinary international reputation in a number of fields, and the thing that's common to all of his kind of engagement, all of these, is that um, Hal has, is permeable. Hal is one of those guys who is open to ideas, open to the possibilities that uh, most people or lots of people are not, and that's what makes him a really quite interesting guy. Uh, you're going to hear all about this program that he did for the CIA, but he's also in the forefront of doing physics on alternative energy, zero-point energy. He's probably the world's expert in the area of zero-point energy. He's also interested in faster-than-light travel and anti-gravity kind of things and how you build a ship to take you to Alpha Centauri, and, uh, and it's really quite fascinating every time I get a chance to uh, spend some time and talk with him. And people are after him like crazy, and I'm just blessed that he answers my telephone calls. On <laughs> so we're really quite happy to have you with us tonight, Hal. Uh, we're also happy to have uh, Joe McMonagall. Uh, Joe is, is sitting down here, and Joe McMonagall, you'll hear about Joe McMonagall. Joe McMonagall, McMonagall was the first remote viewer. He was a warrant officer in the Army at the time and is responsible for a number of the things that Hal's going to talk about. And maybe if we're lucky we'll get him to come up afterwards and to tell us a quick story or something about some of the things he literally did. This will make for an interesting question and answer period afterwards. But to start it off, Dr. Harold put off. Thanks, Hal. Thanks, Hal. Well, to begin with, a reasonable question might be, what's a nice physicist like you doing in an area like this? <laughs> but I think you'll see, I'm going to give you the answer to, those, to that question, <clears throat> and I think you'll see that without a doubt, this has been one of the most fascinating pieces of my career. Not one that I planned, as you'll see, but one that uh, just turned up, and there I was. The right guy in the right place at the right time, or right guy in the wrong place at the right time. You'll see that I've started, I've labeled this CIA initiated remote viewing program at SRI International. Although CIA initiated it and the first programs were with the CIA, it wasn't very long before as our results began, uh, began to be known around the community that we then en ended up with separate contracts with the Navy, with the Air Force, with the Army, with some places I still can't name. And finally, the Defense Intelligence Agency came in as kind of an over uh, site, over umbrella kind of function. And so most of the work that we did uh, in this period was uh, really, you would have to say, a DIA program, Defense Intelligence Agency. To give you a bit of a timeline, <clears throat> historically the project was top secret, special access program. And you'll see these names, Scan8, Sunstreak, Centerlane, Grillflame, and so on. What that meant was that they were also code word protected. So that means that someone could have a top secret clearance, but they could not get access to the program or to any of its results unless they were on a special list. It was that very well protected. At present, about 20% of the content of the program is still classified. But a declassification program uh, began as the Cold War was winding down in 1995. In July of 95, the CIA program, which ran for three years, was declassified, including most of the content. And in September of 95, an unclassified history of the program was released, but not very much of the content published as part of a CIA-funded uh, study to give an overview of the program. Oops, I must have pushed the wrong button. OK. 
Yeah, it's safer there. I'll do it this way. As part of this declassification program, uh, many of the documents began to be declassified, and that's the tally as of the present time. 90,000 pages have been released. And another 20,000 pages are still classified. Now, they're actually classified for good reasons. Uh, many of the uh, remote viewing uh, involved uh, remote viewing terrorist activities, involved remote viewing uh, drug running. And so actually a lot of the parts that are still classified are actually to protect viewers. Because if the bad guys out there began to realize how good remote viewing was, it could create a problem for remote viewers. So that's a large part of why some of the material remains classified. Now maybe one of the most uh, paranormal things you might say of the program was the fact that it ever got started at a place like SRI. This is SRI in uh, Menlo Park, California, this set of buildings here. At the time it was doing about $300 million worth of business a year, uh, about a third of it for private industry, two-thirds of it for the government, and of the part done for the government, about half of it for uh, Department of Defense and intelligence agencies. When the program started, we were in a building up front here called uh, uh, Bioelectronics. But very quickly when the program, because of its results, began to get highly classified, we ended up in a building called the Radio Physics Laboratory here, which was guarded. And our program was in a secluded cubicle on top of the building, cyber lock doors and all that kind of thing. Now the way I got involved in this was that <clears throat> I had just finished uh, co-authoring a textbook while I was at Stanford University on fundamentals of quantum electronics, lasers, that kind of thing. And there's nothing like writing a textbook to realize how little you know. And as part of that uh, quandary of struggling to put things in the textbook and then realizing what you don't know, I became interested in the issue that many physicists at the time were interested in, and that is, well, we can handle inanimate uh, objects, we can handle particle collisions, we can look at astrophysical phenomena, but what about things like life, like consciousness? Is it just that it's too complex but eventually we'll be able to figure it all out from quantum physics, or do we have to extend physics? And so that was something I was struggling with, as were many of my colleagues, and about that time was when uh, a well-known polygra uh, polygraph expert by the name of Cleve Baxter was doing experiments, and one day, just on a lark, he happened to connect his polygraph up to a plant. You see on people, and then he thought of, uh, burning a leaf on the plant to see what response he would get. When he had the thought, the plant responded. And so that started a whole series of experiments where he seemed to have gathered uh, data indicating that uh, living organisms that are brought up together are somehow in, in contact with each other. And so I thought that was kind of neat. Uh, these days we would talk about in terms of quantum entanglement. I thought, okay, well maybe we can learn something about organic life, consciousness, or whatever, by examining interactions between plants, between algae cultures, or whatever. So what I did, from a purely physics standpoint, I wrote up a proposal to be funded where I was going to take some algae culture that had grown together, separate them by five miles, uh, zap one with a laser beam, and see if there was a response on the other one. See if I could measure the velocity of propagation between the two, and so on. So I sent that off to Cleve Baxter to see what he thought of my idea. And one of these serendipitous things, I gotta tell you, it scares me when I think how my life has changed because of real flukes. But here's an example. It just so happened that Cleve Baxter went to a cocktail party in New York City, and while there he met an artist by the name of Ingo Swan. 